You are attending a webinar on contract management. It's a case study from Rochester Regional. We have two very special guests here with us today, Stephanie and Lisa, co-presenting with our Stephanie. And with that, I give you Stephanie, Lisa, and Stephanie. <sighs> Thank you, Keith, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, here's a quick glimpse at our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about us, uh, both Rochester and RPI, um, you know, where this project started, uh, what the goals um, and solutions were that were implemented, and what those key results were, uh, as well as spending some, a good amount of time on uh, lessons learned that we've had throughout this project. So uh, very quickly, a little bit about RPI. Uh, we've been around for over 18 years covering all areas of law and supply chain finance, uh, HCM. Uh, we also have a technical and uh, imaging practice. So anything in for Lawson, uh, we know it. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm Stephanie Cole. I am uh, the director of our finance and supply management practice. Um, I have uh, just about nine years in for loss and experience and prior to joining the RPI team, I worked for a large healthcare organization in Massachusetts. And hi, I'm Lisa Spittle. Uh, I've been in healthcare for about 20 years, IT, and the most recent uh, three years I've been working within for loss and implementations and supply chain and accounts payable solutions. Uh, we have a, a lot of document management um, background and um, very strong interest in integrations of systems. And she's a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> I am Stephanie Marquez. Um, I've been with Rochester for a couple of years now and prior to that I come from a project management background in manufacturing. Um, I've also did some work in supply chain within that manufacturing capacity so I have some experience in that as well. Um, I'm new to uh, the supply chain systems administrator position at Rochester um, and it's it's pretty exciting, all the different changes that we've got coming as a health system, and I'm really excited to be a part of that. So our healthcare system is rapidly growing. Um, we're a large nonprofit integrated health system in upstate New York, um, centered on Rochester. Um, we, in July 2014, merged with another large system and a couple smaller health systems, uh, and we are continuing to grow uh, and expand and uh, we're definitely feeling some growing pains and supporting a larger and larger region. Uh, and we're very proud of the fact that in December 2017, we achieved HIMSS Level 7 certification. So where we started, um, on 1-1-2016, very shortly after the merger, we went live on the Lawson products for the integrated um, system. And that included a big bang of all the products that we own, which is um, the S3 uh, Landmark System Foundation products, GL, AC, PO, you can read them on the screen, um, Smart Office, Mingle, every way that you can access the system, we are doing it. Um, Landmark apps, we have an extensive suite of process flows, process automation. We implemented APIA, um, integrated with Perceptive's um, Intelligent Capture. Our product, we have cash and treasury management, contract management, um, and we'll soon, we own but have not yet used recall management. We also ha integrate with Epic. Uh, we use, as I said, ImageNow and um, MHC Document Express. So our big bang approach, um, we had to go much more quickly than a normal project would go. So we have a lot of implementation pain from our starting point in 1-1-2016. And um, that really led us to need to reach out and optimize some of the solutions we put in place then um, that were not implemented as well as we all might like. Mm -hmm. So a whole lot, uh, whole lot of products, <coughs> basically everything under the sun except for uh, HR, GHR, um, and uh, you know that's that's a lot to take on. Yes. Um, and you know it, it's been exciting for us, our RPI, to be introduced to uh, Rochester because. Um, considering you took on so much in such a short period of time, um, pretty advanced users that have been able to do a whole lot with the system. Um, we, we usually, it takes a while of uh, organizations utilizing the system for so long to be at uh, where you are. Um, there's always room for improvement, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you really 
feel like you uh, took advantage of um, the systems that were in place and now you're just looking to build on top of that. So, so yeah, having this big bang approach, um, there was a lot of challenges that came with that. Um, so um, Rochester uh, sought uh, after uh, a partner to help really take a look at what's been happening uh, with use of the M4 Lawson system and supply chain um, and, and see what improvements could be made, uh, if there was any kind of gaps during implementation that should be corrected um, that are causing downstream effects. So, um, you know, with contract management in particular, um, it was basically put in uh, just a few weeks before you went live, right? Mm -hmm. So it was set up very basic uh, without the future in mind. Um, and, you know, although um, it had been working okay, there was just a lot of um, system administration rules that weren't necessarily understood that were causing some issues uh, during activation of the contracts. Um, uh, for this project in particular, because it was just implemented a few weeks uh, or turned on a few weeks before implementation, um, you know, it, it was just for um, certain types of contracts, not everything for the full organization. So uh, Rochester was really hoping to make a change there and improve visibility. Mm -hmm. um, there were still a good amount of business processes that um, had workarounds um, because the system just wasn't as well understood or, or knew there was certain functionality out there to help capture that. Um, and then there were some processes in place but not exactly being followed. Uh, on the training side, uh, again, for um, having such a big bang approach and having a lot of applications, uh, I still found the team uh, uh, was pretty well educated with, with the basics. It was just layering on top of that of, you know, how certain setup affects um, certain processing rules in the system. Um, and, and none of that knowledge was there. The, um, the um, item functionality component and integration with contract management wasn't there. Um, but from what was being self-taught was done very well in such a short period of time. Um, there also wasn't too much documentation that was left over. It was uh, either just the generic M4 documentation or, or staff created some <laughs> job aids herself, uh, which is still something to be proud of, um, but we really wanted to layer on to that. And then on the technology side, um, considering there was all these um, uh, supporting applications, they weren't necessarily talking to each other. So uh, requisitions, um, you know, weren't flowing into contract management. Um, there wasn't kind of any kind of automated integration with the document management system. Um, so there was lots of opportunity to make this process better. So that's where they um, started working with us. So um, first things first, we really uh, focused on uh, defining a project approach, uh, which is everything that you, you'd think a project would cover, right? Um, since Rochester already had contract management implemented, um, it made this uh, project uh, a little bit of a lower risk because there was already something in place that was working, just not optimally, right? So uh, we really took the first step of um, the project initiation to make sure that we understood project goals, uh, created a project plan, um, you know, made sure that we had the right project sponsorship, uh, and then we moved forward with planning um, so understanding the project scope and budget, uh, defining some team roles. Uh, we went and did a current state analysis to understand the business processes or lack thereof. Um, and then we went through a high level super user training to help facilitate the design. And then from there, um, we worked on uh, app configuration. So if you joined this morning session with me and Mike Laskin, we covered um, some of the uh, changes that you can do in the system. So during design, it was really important to, um, to uh, make some considerations there, which we'll cover in this presentation. Um, this is also where we cover any testing support, any process flow development, um, the perceptive integration, and any kind of interface or, or conversion uh, support. Uh, and then from uh, there, uh, monitoring and control, this was done throughout the project. Um, just again, uh, going back to the project goals, making sure they were still understood if, if more uh, got layered in, which it always does, right? Um, quality of deliverables, so uh, making sure there was proper handoff of 
um, you know, uh, the configurations that RPI was doing and making sure that Rochester had something to fall back on once we were gone, um, which there wasn't too much of that um, during the initial uh, implementation, so we really wanted to fill that gap. Um, also communication, and we did perform a, a project health check uh, just about, um, it was right before, um, or, or in the middle of testing, just to make sure to see how we were doing um, and what we needed to check in on. And then from there, uh, go live and closure. So uh, end user training was performed on the um, uh, contract managers, administrators, end users that are going to be enter, uh, entering the information. Uh, we did a lot of cutover planning uh, to plan for the go live and turning on all the flows. Um, so it was pretty detailed and there was a lot, of, a, a lot more um, you know, related tasks that were involved, but for the most part, uh, this was the approach that we had. Uh, part of our goals for this project was to help uh, increase efficiencies and going paperless um, is one of them. So we, as Stephanie mentioned, have been using contract management in the past for specific contract types and subtypes, but this project allowed us to kind of integrate everything across the system, uh, multiple departments. So creating a central repository for that information and really kind of leveraging the accessibility that different departments would have to their specifics. Um, so some of the things that we're using, obviously, the M4 contract management, uh, the process automation, and then, uh, as Lisa mentioned, the perceptive image now piece is big for us. <coughs> Sorry. So before this project, um, the purchasing department was using a shared drive to house copies of all their contracts um, and a fil filing cabinets, of course, paper and emails which is not a very efficient way to share information and to know what you have and where it is. Um, with this project, we're now cap allowing our end users to capture contract documents in RQC and have them be attached to the contract that gets created in contract management, which is huge. Um, we're also enabling scanning and also scanning by a virtual printer so they can print right into Perceptive and attach it to, image, uh, to a contract manager. Um, we've also built some buttons so that they can, when they were working the contract in contract management, they can look up the documents that are associated with it or link in new ones. Um, and we aren't actually using electronic approvals yet, but we've staged the system so that we can when we're ready. At this point, most of the approvals, most of the contracts we receive are pre-approved by the time they hit contract management, um, but we've built in approval flows to use in future. Uh, in, in addition, in future we have, um, as we're capturing each contract document, it's being OCR'd so that in future we will enable full text search, uh, which is particularly important to our legal department. Uh, we're testing that. Every document in production right now is already being OCR'd. Uh, we just haven't enabled the end users yet to use the full text search tools. But as we te tweak those, that's going to be huge for our end user departments. Absolutely. And, and that's what would end up being housed in Perceptive, in Perceptive. Image now, and then utilizing the buttons to, to go out yep. uh, into the other system. And I should say one of the key uh, decisions that was made early on was not to use the redlining tools in contract management, at least for now. Mm -hmm. So it's really just being used to house and manage the contracts. Yeah, that's an important note, right? Because just because it's there and it's available doesn't mean it's the right fit um, right. for your business or or even just uh, you know making sure during the design process that um, you're taking all these tools and ideas into consideration, but then really making sure that it, it's for the right um, reasons. Yeah. Um, so uh, when Rochester first implemented, um, the contract types were very, very basic. It was, bas it was what type of um, uh, PO agreement it was creating. So it was contract, quote, mm -hmm. uh, very basic. So um, that was a big change that, that we did too, uh, really categorizing the contract types and subtype. So they were very specific to their business needs. And then that's really what the electronic approvals are going to uh, end up utilizing, right? So all the GPO contracts, um, even uh, in most instances, the service agreements, they're not going to necessarily go through contract approval unless there's an amendment and you're not having them go through uh, a requisition for a change request, right? So um, all of those key design sessions um, 
you know, making those decisions are, are really valuable for the end goal, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you can leverage IPA to only grab certain things. So again, you're not, you know, creating duplicate work for, for no reason. I also uh, would like to add that I know with this project, keeping in mind the future and the direction in which the organization may be headed was something that was a priority for us as well. And being able to have the flexibility to continue to add on additional efficiencies later down the road is, is certainly a driver for that. Absolutely. Sure. You know, don't need to do everything at work at once. Right. You know, uh, take certain parts and, and start moving forward, have some, some successes there, and then go on to the next initiative. Mm -hmm. So document capture from the requisition to invoice allows the employees to focus on value add tasks. I know you're not supposed to read the slide to people, but that's such an important concept that um, I felt it was important to do so. <laughs> um, because our employees are so stretched for time and every little bit that we can take away that's not value added is a benefit to the organization. And this project is enabling us to move forward in that way. Um, Supply chain, legal, and the end user departments now can have visibility to the contracts that they are authorized to see. So we no longer have the hunt for, do we have a contract with this vendor already? I don't know. Who do we got to contact to find out? We can use our central repository and make use of it also for efficient renewals, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, our second goal was the data entry automation piece. Um, as Lisa mentioned previously, our resources are pretty stretched uh, to the max. And so any improvement that we can do to help um, just increase the efficiency all around in the department and for the system itself is certainly a priority. Um, and as, again, as Lisa mentioned, um, just having that visibility to review what you have coming and attacking it from a uh, proactive approach rather than a reactive approach is a driver as well. Um, and so we've, we've really taken that into account when considering uh, what this goal would look like for us. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that uh, Rochester really wanted to spend some time on was um, the 832 uh, price file automation. Um, and you know, uh, you had a lot of punch out vendors uh, mm -hmm. that you had started to work with. Um, so trying to automate um, the agreed upon price in a way that um, you know, should be tied to the contract, or just having a good price list that the system could rely on. Um, just taking the time to invest in that functionality because it's pretty straightforward. Um, so that was also um, a goal to focus in on. Of how, does it, how does this work? And you know, when do we want to move forward with turning it on? Yep. So our before picture, uh, we had many tools, um, duplicate entry of contract header, um, so that we could use contract management in a rudimentary way to identify our contracts, but we still manage them as PO20 traditional POs, uh, which we'll talk about again in a little bit. Um, not the best way to use the tools. Um, with this project, um, we re the requester enters the request for a contract right through Requisition Center. With the appropriate criteria, it creates a draft contract in um, Contract Manager, and the contract team can then work it um, and review, modify, release it, and create those service agreements that are needed uh, in addition to pricing and the other agreements they were previously working in contract management. Um, in addition, we needed to update some invoice processing rules. That's still a work in process, but um, it definitely will help with data entry on the AP team side um, if those GL distributions and the, the uh, payment stream can be sent automatically into APIA along with the invoice. So. so taking a look at our service agreements before, I can't stress how manual the process was for our buyers um, and even our end users. So as Lisa mentioned, being able to have our end user capture their service agreement in Requisition Center just helps to initiate the process that much quicker. Um, during the AP side as well, before the process uh, was very manual, we were having our buyers load lines every time they would get an invoice, um, which just it created a lot of a lot of keystrokes and a lot of unnecessaries. Um, so afterwards, again, it's just become a really uh, automated system that we've been allowed or been able to kind of track the progress, taking away some of those manual steps, but also having the visibility on it and access to it if we need it. 
So this spaghetti diagram <laughs> really shows kind of end to end the process for a service agreement now uh, with what was built with this project. So the green stream is the Infor products. The aqua colored at the bottom is perceptive and the yellow is MHC. We leveraged a lot of existing processing in addition to adding new. So for example, in our QC, we add an attach button, which then indexes the document that they've attached into perceptive and um, they can view it also from there. Once they release from our QC, a, a process flow evaluates it to see if it meets the criteria that says I should create a contract out of this requisition and if so it does that and um, then once it's in um, contract manager there's communication back and forth as well between perceptive and Infor so that we keep um, the data that's indexed in perceptive in sync with the M4 contract management product, which is our source of truth for all the data about contracts. But we want to make it as easy as possible to find the right contract with the right data and perceptive as well. Um, once the contract is actually released and activated from contract manager, um, we have another process flow that um, automatically runs the PO229 report that the end user would otherwise have to go into PO25 and click a button to create that purchase order that needs to be sent to the vendor. So instead we have the process automation uh, create that trigger, build that document and send it in through MHC f using existing process that we use for PO20 POs and um, index that automatically into image now. And then the buyer or the person working in contract management can um, print that out with any necessary other documents and send that off to the vendor with a awesome. copy to the user. Yeah, just chiming in, what's been nice about this whole process flow is it allows the person who's working the contract to go to one place to gather all of that information. Yes. So the contract is there. Um, we as a system have identified what supporting documents may we, we may want from our end users or our buyers and then the PO. So they can go to one place yes. and find all the documentation that they're looking for. Right, and it's very valuable to index all that information along the way, right? So if you're um, searching by contract but you only have that requisition number, you're able to find all that detail and, and bring it all together. Right. Um, you know, contract management does offer the ability to create like uh, document templates uh, that could in fact create something like a, a pretty uh, service agreement, but it was still missing some key fields mm -hmm. that Rochester wanted to bring in from contract management. And, and since MHC was already in use and they had the pretty PO already uh, intact, it made the most sense to utilize MHC um, to create that pretty service agreement PO and move forward. So. Um, okay, so this one, um, we had to make some changes in our APIA configuration as well to support this, um, both in uh, assignment and in routing for approval after the invoice comes in. Uh, we needed to make some changes in the intelligent capture uh, configuration and the connect runtime configuration to enable PIC to recognize that it's a service PO. Uh, and send the correct handling code over to APIA so that APIA would accept the invoice and create it. Um, and that was probably the easiest part of the whole project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, even if you don't have APIA in place, uh, I think really just uh, automating the process of the SVC PO code and the yes. SVC um, handling code for AP really created some efficiencies too. Yes. So. Uh, Rochester took it like five steps forward to automate the process, but even in its most simplest um, sense, that can be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I, we may talk about this again in a future slide, but um, this is also where we have a future enhancement that we want to make of um, being able to actually extract and send the GL data from the invoice over into APIA. Currently, the um, end user in AP has to pull that in from the service agreement when they're working the invoice. So, a lot of extra work. <laughs> um, so, you know, there is a, a pretty uh, good amount of key results here. Um, 
I think one of the most valuable is that there, there's one source of entry for uh, requesters and one uh, source of approval uh, for the approvers, uh, just utilizing requisition centers. So uh, removing the need for that SharePoint um, form and, and yeah, taking the thinking out of it for the requester, right? I'm just going here and here's how I need to process my order and if I need to check status, I'm gonna be able to look here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, creating that automation between uh, supply chain and AP um, to, you know, uh, break down the, the, the walls of um, AP having to process this extra work and uh, talk back and forth with purchasing to add somewhat bogus lines just for approval where you really can utilize the system for that. So I, I feel like these are pretty huge wins um, for, for Rochester. Mm. And uh, another goal of ours is, is really kind of taking a look at our specific configurations as well as different security measures that we want to take utilizing the system. Um, it's important for us to be able to identify the roles uh, that people play within the contract management system. So uh, we took this project as an opportunity to kind of review that and see how we can utilize it. Um, and it just helps to improve the process of the service agreements, um, getting them out the door, getting them to the vendor uh, and back to the end user. Um, as well as um, enabling some of that EDI 32 as well. Mm -hmm. So before um, contract management was accessible only by the pricing contract team in the supply mm -hmm. chain team. Um, with this project, we've now enabled access by uh, and actions based on contract type and the role of the user. So more people are able to make use of it and um, gain the benefits of it. Uh, we also coordinated um, the security to accessing documents in Perceptive to tie to the contract type that's in um, contract management. So all of the security is based on contract type and subtype and what actions they can perform. Uh, in the future, we'll be adding some additional roles and restrictions as we roll out to additional departments who maybe shouldn't see some other department's documents or who we know can't see some other department's documents, particularly legal. Um, Certainly, uh, physician agreements are particularly sensitive. We need to make sure only the appropriate people can see those. Um, and also, we intend to expand our use of the 832 EDI catalog imports that Stephanie mentioned. Uh, so there's lots of different components to this um, from a security standpoint. We really leverage Configuration Console uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, one was, um, was configuration just to improve the end user experience and again take the thinking out of it uh, just because you have fields there doesn't mean that you're supposed to fill them in for particular scenarios uh, so we've spent a lot of time during design to understand uh, you know what the unique needs of Rochester uh, were um, so what kind of fields weren't captured as part of the delivered contract management setup that we wanted to layer in um, and also just making some things a little bit easier. So uh, Rochester in particular has their, um, their own hierarchy that's utilized for requisition center and even invoice approvals, right? So, um, you know, thinking ahead for contracts being approved or, or even seeing who's responsible for this contract right. in that period of time, right? Um, there's an area to put who the contact is uh, in contract management, but that person could change like 10 plus times throughout the contract <laughs> life cycle, right? So for the contract administrator to have to keep doing the spreadsheet designer uploads, it's just crazy, right? So uh, we were able to um, leverage some functionality that it basically is just looking at um, uh, that hierarchy at that point in time and will display that, the name that's responsible uh, at that moment in time. So really valuable. Um, uh, feature that we added in there. Uh, we actually uh, also hid some unused fields, uh, so strategic sourcing is not currently in use, mm -hmm. so we hid some of those fields, and um, Rochester is also not utilizing the supplier portal um, and not managing um, contacts for suppliers. It just doesn't seem to make sense at this point. Um, if there are uh, certain reps that are responsible for a contract that they want to track, you're adding those, right? But again, another thing to maintain that doesn't necessarily seem worthwhile, right? So uh, we did help default some fields in when a new supplier is being added, so that should help. Um, but um, yeah, again, just improving that process. Um, 
we defaulted some fields that I feel like are pretty um, straightforward, but they're good, easy wins, mm -hmm. and that's defaulting the contract group. Rochester just has one. Let's just default that in. Mm -hmm. And then the supplier contacts, pretty much always going to be one, and if it's not, it's overridden. Uh, and uh, the worst one of them all is uh, it doesn't automatically default to the United States of America, and you have to go way down the list <laughs> to find it, which is super frustrating. So we defaulted that in as well, uh, which has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then um, contract management does come with a out-of-the-box link to a document management system. But in Rochester's case, they wanted to automate it a step further because it wasn't just retrieval. We wanted to allow the buyer, contract administration, who, a contract administrator, whoever's in that screen, to be able to capture as part of the contract. Yes. Um, so um, those are all configurations that we did. And then on the security side, um, you know, um, there were uh, some managers that only um, have access to certain contract types or subtypes. Um, and M4 delivers these security classes that are driven off contract classifications, which are really used, leveraged for contract approval, uh, what type of approval you want it to go through, um, where here it just made much more sense to have that be driven by contract type. Uh, so we created some custom uh, security classes and roles to accomplish that, and it's utilizing actor context um, to just quickly go in and find whether or not they should have access. Um, however, um, in their unique business case, they have some scenarios where um, some contract managers should have access to see certain contracts but not access to edit them. Uh, so we had to uh, uh, create some custom security roles for that and hard code some of the contract uh, types and subtypes in to meet that need. Uh, we're still doing some additional testing there um, to make sure all of that's covered, but um, you know, uh, although it was unique to Rochester, I can see that uh, pretty common uh, throughout users of contract management. Uh, and this is just a walkthrough of those actor contexts. Um, so out of the box or, you know, what you should do during implementation is making sure that certain ones uh, have some key fields in. Uh, without this, like without this procurement group filled in for the user that's logging in, they won't be able to, um, you know, create new items or have the right kind of integration with S3. It will give them a bunch of security errors, that's why. Um, and then here we have the contract type and subtype that are leveraged. Um, and uh, this is showing the, um, uh, the view into the contract types and the filter that was applied um, to meet that personalization need. And then uh, on the configuration side, um, this is a quick snapshot that you probably can't see unless you have the, uh, the PowerPoint just up on your screen. Uh, so this is what the contract, the create contract form looked like before and how we customized it. Um, so you can see the defaulted fields in here of contract group and supplier contact. You can see how the company account unit approval is displayed here and how there's a, a name that would end up displaying. Uh, and then a whole bunch of you know, um, hidden fields and some uh, custom check boxes. So again, very custom to what they needed as part of the business process and again, make it easier for the end user entering the contract. So um, the supply team, chain team is now able to see and manage every contract they need to see appropriately by their role, which is huge for us. Uh, and we've positioned ourselves now to start our rollout to the legal department and other departments who have a secure central repository. And uh, as Stephanie mentioned, um, we've significantly improved the end user experience using Contract Manager um, by con the configuration changes that were made. One of our final goals that I'm incredibly passionate about is documentation and training. Um, being new to the system and to healthcare, it was more or less, here you go, and, and you had mentioned previously, a, a lot of what we learned in our department was self-taught. So we really wanted to utilize this opportunity to really create the documentation that we would need for future state or for new employees coming into uh, the system. So we've just created, um, you know, Microsoft tools that we've we've done. Um, we've really utilized the training rooms that we have available at the system um, to get larger groups of people together. And then we've done smaller sessions as well. So our documentation training before was very much on the fly. Um, screenshots, maybe a couple notes here and there, um, but nothing that was um, 
really kind of standardized. Um, so after, uh, as mentioned, we've created custom instruction manuals uh, specific to the user. So we have a different um, instruction manual for our contract and pricing folks rather than the buyers. They don't need the same information, so we've kind of split it out for them, um, which is the custom job aids. Um, and then we're just keeping in mind kind of future state, how we want to move, and how can we utilize the tools now that we've put in place to kind of help us in the future. Mm -hmm. So as, as Rochester's partner um, looking to optimize the system some more, uh, a big part of that was super user training, right? Mm -hmm. So um, showing what the tool is capable of and talking through business process some more. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's important uh, working with any organization. The system can do a lot, right? But what's your business process and what do you need it to do? And, you know, uh, trying to outline what the system can do for you and, you know, making sure there's a detailed process in place. So, uh, you know, uh, we focused on creating basically some draft documentation to cover certain areas, but really tried to empower mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie and Lisa to dig into that more to make sure it was making the right connections, right? Because we are outsiders, um, you know, seeing and bringing in ideas of what we've seen work very well, but uh, everyone's different and you have your own unique um, scenarios that you need to cover and you're going to be the one supporting the system as this new functionality is layered in, right? Um, so uh, it was really important for us to work together and make sure that we had the right fit for what you needed. Uh, focusing the right kind of time on the, the right tasks that you guys were actually going to find value from. Yep. Um, so these training guides I feel really helped enable or kick off um, uh, testing. So, uh, you know, helping with a little bit of the translation where probably um, maybe 50, 50 or 30% of what I may have educated you, you ended up showing the end users, right? Because it was very specific. Right. Um, so it's just a piece of the, the whole puzzle. Right, <laughs> and we utilize this project to really kind of dive into that testing and really have a, a good understanding of the importance of the testing. Um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, our goal live was, was pretty quick and it was on the heels of a, of a larger acquisition. So those test scripts, we didn't really have them. So we use this project as an opportunity to utilize um, and creating contract um, management test scripts that we would be able to use for the future. Um, when we held our testing sessions, we incorporated um, some of our end users, and, and that was probably about our second or third round of, of testing, so we were more on the validation side. But it was important for us to capture from the end user what their input was. Um, Lisa and I don't work in the same space that they do, so it was really important to gather that feedback um, from the user in case we missed something in those specific scenarios as you mentioned earlier. So we utilized, you know, just a, a comment sheet which was hugely beneficial. People were very candid, gave us some great feedback that we were able to then translate into kind of our final end uh, buttoning up for the project. Absolutely. Super valuable and and not always done or even considered, right? Um, sometimes you get some feedback that you really don't want to hear but you need to hear, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So I like you said, this really helped button up uh, a lot of different processes and make sure that things were documented well or um, were um, documented more clearly mm -hmm. to make the right connection to the end mm -hmm. user. It also actually helped to identify scenarios that people hadn't raised during the business process discussions. Yes. Um, because they brought examples of real work to some of those sessions as like, oh, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. uh, it was extremely helpful. Yeah, great point. Yep, so just, you know, I'm happy to report a huge success in the document and training <laughs> aspect. Um, but it really kind of helped us understand, you know, what the system is capable of. Being new, fairly new still to the system, I can recall having conversations with people saying, we're literally just scratching the surface of this, mm -hmm. of this tool and it can really be beneficial for us. So um, we've been able to provide the end users with the supporting documentation that they'll need. So after we meet with them, whether it be in a group setting or one-on-one, -on -one, they can feel confident when they go back to their desk and actually are using the application. Um, and we've also taken an approach as sort of the face of the tool itself within the system. Um, so we've certainly done, um, made it a priority to engage our end users and kind of help build the departmental relationships of the different teams that we also work with. Yeah, very, very powerful. Um, you know, the end users are your customers, right? And there's a whole lot of them and uh, perception is reality. It's hard for them to see how much work is actually being done behind the scenes. So a project like this can really help um, 
you know, create more visibility into what's actually happening, build those relationships, and just really help you be successful as an organization. Absolutely. All right, on to the juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Lessons learned. So uh, uh, this project has uh, spanned over a year. Uh, there's been a lot of work, um, a good amount of challenges, um, but I'd say way more successes than, than challenges. We've learned a lot together. Um, so we're hoping to share some of that with you. Um, so really a big one for us, um, uh, I feel like my number one, uh, just from being a, a partner and, and lead on, on this project, is uh, defining and managing project roles and responsibilities. Uh, this is something that we did at the beginning of the project, and I initially thought it was very clear, but throughout the project, uh, it was becoming less and less clear, um, I think for both of us, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, a, a big um, piece of advice is really just to focus on the, the project roles, not necessarily the, the people that are performing them, uh, and making sure that there's clear expectations of what that resource can expect throughout the project life cycle, um, you know, what the responsibilities are going to be, and really making sure that you take a look at what, what amount of their day is going to be um, uh, used on on helping with this project right and making sure all of that works in with your your um, milestones um, and you know uh, like it was uh, towards where testing was happening and we didn't necessarily have clear leads defined we knew who they were they were uh, <laughs> Stephanie and Lisa but it wasn't actually verbalized for a while that we really had a call out no, this is who we want. They're, they're going to be the ones to really help enforce change throughout the organization. They're, everything's clicking to them. They're the ones, right? And it, it, was, uh, it was just unspoken before there, then. It was obvious, but just making sure something was uh, clear. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, um, we did do a, a project health check halfway through and, and had a strong pro uh, project sponsorship at the, at the beginning. Um, but also had a lot of conflicting projects that were happening at the same time. So it was really hard to make sure that we were continually focused throughout the project because we had a lot of stops mm -hmm. throughout the way. Mm -hmm. um, along with that is making sure, you know, as part of uh, understanding roles and responsibilities is having a, a, a comprehensive project plan. We were talking a little bit about this last night and where the project started and where our project plan started. Um, it involved a lot mm -hmm. and we tried to keep up with it, but essentially the, um, the way the tasks were documented wasn't really a great fit uh, for how the project had evolved over time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, making sure you take the step back and, and reassess and reapproach. Um, I feel like we did a pretty good job, but we, we knew that was one thing that we wanted to focus more time on, but we prioritized elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yep. um, uh, I think, um, you know, adding to the project tools, you have anything you mm -hmm. wanted to add about that? Well, I think the, the use of a shared tool that both the consultant and the company can use is extremely helpful. And um, a couple of us, myself included, <laughs> were a little bit resistant because we have 10 other tools that we have to document the same exact work. So I think it's important when you're starting the project to de de decide this is the tool we're going to use and this is how we're going to use it and who owns it or how it's shared. And we, RPI tried to do that for us and I think we didn't do a very good job as an entire team of making use of some of the power that's out there. And I think to kind of piggyback off of what you said earlier, there was this unspokenness of, you know, Lisa and myself's involvement in, in that project, but, uh, you know, expectations and, and really identifying what those are and a, and a tool such as that is, is an expectation, you know, mm -hmm. it, it helps to keep everybody on the same page. And, you know, while it may have gone unspoken, really understanding the importance and having the urgency behind it would have benefited us. Um, more than than what we yeah. had done so yeah communication is key and even though we did have that that tool that we use we use Smartsheet to help you know keep all the documents in place and the project plan uh, but through our communication we could have linked to it a little bit more reminded each other um, you know that it's important to have that project governance right and and making sure someone's overseeing that and reminding Absolutely. everyone yeah. there's lots of conflicting things going on taking your attention away um, 
Uh, another challenge that we had, uh, again, uh, falls back on the roles and responsibilities as well, um, is just really making sure that you understand um, your, your current process requirements during initial design. Um, so, um, you know, during that project approach that we were talking about earlier, we do a current state uh, assessment, try to get a good understanding of what types of things you're processing today. We're trusting that you're bringing everything to the table that you know uh, and where you want to be. Um, and then during design, we're really mapping out what those requirements are. Well, what needs approval? You know, what fields are required for this type of contract? You know, uh, what are the implications if these aren't, you know, captured? And, and like Lisa was noting, a lot of the scenarios that we found out about were, were during testing or they weren't initially understood during design and, well, we don't have a process, so what do you recommend? And, you know, giving those recommendations and, and coming up with them and then coming back to the design. Um, so I think it also touches back on what we were saying earlier of you don't need to do it all at once. You need mm -hmm. to design with the future in mind, but understanding if you have a, a gap in an area where you're going to need some time to build all that out, add it to your project plan, have that section not be focused on for now, and focus on what you can start to move forward with. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, we did pr uh, provide... Um, some training uh, and deep dive exploration, but again, this ties back to the, the testing. Uh, there was way more scenarios brought in to kick off the testing. Um, so I wasn't on site to go through. Um, uh, Stephanie and Lisa just rocked it, so it was fine. Um, but we did a lot of working sessions afterwards just to walk through certain scenarios and, and, and make sure that the, um, the full process and system capability was um, taken into mind. So uh, there was some testing with, with rebates and um, pricing participants and just some unique things that it was important for us to walk through. Yes. And then on Stephanie and Lisa's side, making sure that um, that you know deeper dive training is just done with those specific users that were actually going to be performing the task. And uh, when we were doing the deep dive um, exploration training at the beginning, I think it was at that point uh, a little bit difficult to know who was the role that was actually going to per be performing this task, right. and right. they needed to be the ones doing the test. So it was over some people's heads, mm -hmm. right? So uh, really important to uh, consider all that uh, really before kicking off mm -hmm. the the training and uh, testing. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, since Rochester had the Big Bang um, go live. Um, there wasn't a strong understanding of um, how all uh, the system and administration in Lawson can affect contract management. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people just with uh, Lawson S3 still struggle with um, item administration because it is funky. Um, if you forget to do one step because you're constantly interrupted, you have this uh, active file in the system that contract management is just going to keep referring to. So the scenario here was um, there was a whole lot of item cleanup. There was a bunch of items inactivated, but PO13 records were still activated out in the system. And that's what contract management is referring to. Mm -hmm. So even before we kicked off this optimization project, um, uh, while I was on site during training, I was like, all right, let's do a spreadsheet designer. Let's do a, <laughs> a MS add-ins, because we had to do two separate ones to clean all that up. So we took care of it, and then it was just added to the process yep. to uh, inactivate those PO13 records. Um, there was also a good amount of uh, duplicate AP vendors, which mm -hmm. are tying to the suppliers, right? And uh, this, this happens a lot, right? Especially when you're combining multiple different health systems. Yes. Um, you know, you can it's a whole separate project to do uh, vendor master cleanup, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we uh, brought in one of our um, analysts who does these vendor master cleanups all the time. Uh, so we created a, a nice access database um, for Rochester to utilize. I don't know if you're still using that, uh, but you've done a lot of work there too, yes. right? So yeah. what was your process to work on the vendor masters? We actually took the data that was provided um, by the document that you're referring to um, and we did, you know, we recruited the appropriate roles or people for those roles. Um, we had a representative from AP that joined us and we kind of, we went through and we vetted. We looked at the ones that were maybe easy for us to eliminate or inactivate, if you will, um, that were those duplicates. 
And then the ones that were a little bit more involved, we made sure we had somebody on the buying side that could look at that detail, check the PO history, kind of give us the information that we needed so we could make the appropriate selection. Um, and we actually did that in multiple phases um, because the file we were working with, it had taken us a while to get there. So by the time we completed round one, um, we set ourselves up to do round two, so. Great. And it's still a work in process. Of course, <laughs> yeah. So part of it is correcting the process so that, you know, uh, when these vendors are being added, uh, they're, they're new and, and aren't being duplicated. Uh, and the other was also prioritizing of those that are duplicates, right. which ones should be worked on first, which mm -hmm. ones are the most embedded, have PO history, you know, how are we actually gonna clean these up? And uh, moving forward, how can we ensure that no new transactions are being created for these vendors that we're gonna end up inactivating? Well, and as you mentioned, um, you know, along the way creating processes to identify that, which I'm happy mm -hmm. to report that we did. Yeah. So when we bring on a new vendor, we have a new, newer process of how we're um, getting that detail into the system that we weren't using before and also creating the supplier on the contract management side where we weren't doing that before either. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, it's been beneficial yeah. and, and it's helped decrease the amount of duplicates that are going into the system. So great. And along sure. with that is just training those that are entering that information, yes. Yes. letting them know what they need to look for and where to find it. And, and so we've, we've done a good job at that. And what it's connected to, right? Because yeah, right. that's half the battle. You're, you're entering one thing and don't understand all the downstream effects of how it's affecting a lot of different business processes or or the you know the person actually processing from there yeah. so um, education is key and you're only going to do that by approaching it head on and digging in and working together as a team mm -hmm. yes um, and then lastly uh, you know this is a huge one for any kind of project is just managing all the conflicts of of competing initiatives you know um, in this particular scenario um, you know IS IT support and and supply chain initiatives there's a lot going on and trying to find the right balance of uh, what you should be working on first and where the priorities are and, and where the downstream effects are right um, so I well in addition system disruptions I mean uh, there were a number of times where we were doing either a loss in CU or a perceptive upgrade or that that caused us to have to set aside testing of this for a while or development of this and then struggle to get it back to where it needed to be after that upgrade to uh, push forward. So mm -hmm. that's definitely something that needs to be considered is what's on the horizon as you're starting out on one of these projects and make sure that's factored in. Absolutely. And, and that pushes out those key milestones, it does. Yeah. right? <laughs> one of the things that we did towards the end of the process, which you know worked out great once we implemented it, was being very intentional about the time that we were designating to the project, yes. um, and and actually putting it on the calendar, removing ourselves from you know our our desks and those disruptions and you know those constant questions. And once we were able to put ourselves in an environment um, that allowed us to give the project the dedication that it needed, it just was it was quick after that. So yeah. lock yourselves in the room. Exactly. Turn Pretty off much. The phone. Yep. <laughs> All right, we have time for questions. Does anyone? We do have a couple of questions here. Um, one is sort of uh, you know related to this, um, though not directly. Do you ever route invoices for services to approvers to verify service was completed? Oh, absolutely, and that's a key part of the processing. Uh, in the past, the old broken process. Uh, the approval was back and forth through emails and lines added into the PO so that they could be matched as a match invoice. In the new process, we're routing based on the authority to act rules in place in our organization of the invoice to approve that yes, this amount of this service was uh, performed and should be paid. Excellent, um, definitely a best practice. How do you consider the negotiation process in the request for a contract? Is that where your legal team would have to get a notification gotcha. from the system and they perform their part of the process? So in our case, the way we're using the system right now, all of that work is done before it hits this processing that we've been talking about. So we haven't yet taken it to the level where they would enter the draft into contract manager and go through all the redlining and approvals there. So in the case of a service contract that comes in through requisition center, the approval for spending the money on that effort is done through the requisition approval process so that when that draft contract 
hits contract manager, it's already approved to be spent. Um, for other contracts, they're negotiated outside of this process and then entered in to the system. Yep, and just to kind of piggyback off of that, we have a process in place that works for our organization. So while that uh, draft contract may have been already created, we then take the documentation that the requisitioner has uploaded to the contract and review it to make sure that right. the appropriate terminology and verbiage is in the agreement. Um, and there are cases where we find that you know we need to add our specific terms and conditions to the contract and then it goes through our contract administrators and our contract manager before we release it for a purchase order. Mm -hmm. And in this scenario, although uh, legal at the beginning was a part of the design, uh, we chose to put them on, on holds so we could really focus on um, you know, working on the more supply chain related contracts, getting stronger understanding of the tool and the workflows in place. Um, but we did uh, speak about utilizing the uh, negotiations and, and redlining mm -hmm. on document to enable legal to take a look and then negotiate with the vendor too on the red lines that were happening. We just never got as far as actually turning that on and exploring. Uh, and Rochester may find that utilizing contract management for that isn't that great of a fit and legal would like to use their own mm -hmm. kind of process outside mm -hmm. of the system but still capture some of those revisions through uh, document management mm -hmm. and linking to that in contract management. So yeah. mm -hmm. still some integration there but may not be using all of the functionality as it's right. delivered in contract management because it just may not be the the right fit for what you're looking for and need Correct. at least not yet yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much stephanie and lisa really enjoyed having you really Thanks. appreciate you thank coming you. down and doing this with us